By now, you've heard about Global Poker, one of the fastest growing online card rooms available in the US and Canada today. So what's stopping you from trying it out? Global Poker is a safe and secure social poker site that uses their own patented sweepstakes model. Signing up is easy. You can use Google, Facebook, or just an email address. You can always play for free on Global Poker, but you can also buy gold coins for additional play, which will earn sweeps coins that can be redeemed for real cash to a bank account, Skrill account, or even as a gift card. Get a free 5,000 gold coins when you sign up right now at GlobalPoker.com. Poker Stories is an audio series that features casual interviews with some of the game's best players and personalities. Each episode highlights a well-known figure in the poker world and dives deep into their favorite tales, both on and off the felt. Hello and welcome to Poker Stories, a podcast brought to you by Card Player, the Poker Authority, and hosted by me, Julio Rodriguez. This is episode number 105, which means that we are officially kicking off year number five of the Poker Stories podcast. And we are kicking it off in style with Michael Schwimmer. Now, despite being a poker show, we've had some pretty great athletes on the podcast, including Greg Mueller, who played pro hockey in Germany, and uh, Joao Vieira, who played basketball for the Portuguese national team. Mike Leah was a wrestler, uh, Vince Van Patten was a tennis standout, and both Seth Davies and Eric Baldwin played baseball. But none of these guys can touch Michael Schwimmer. Michael is from Virginia, where he was a standout athlete in three sports, excelling in baseball and basketball. In fact, he was so good, he was named Player of the Year and MVP over NBA center Roy Hibbert when his team won the championship. He had offers to play for both Coach K at Duke and Rick Pitino at Louisville, but he ultimately chose to play baseball near his home at the University of Virginia. Although he was drafted as a junior, he decided to finish school and get his degree before being drafted by the Philadelphia Phillies. Michael spent three years in the minors before ultimately getting to live out his dream when he was called up to the majors in 2011. After his baseball career ended, he started a big league advance, which is a company that uh, essentially bankrolls promising minor league prospects in exchange for a percentage of their future earnings. His second company, uh, Jambos, is now positioning itself for the rapidly expanding sports betting market. But why did I ask a former Major League Baseball pitcher turned sports betting CEO to come on the podcast? Well, that's because Michael will be playing in the very first episode of the High Stakes Poker Reboot, coming to you this December to Poker Go. As it turns out, Michael has been playing quite a bit of High Stakes Poker of the years, uh, which we will get into during this podcast. Anyway, that's enough intro. Here's my conversation with Michael Schwimmer. I am here with the one and only Michael Schwimmer. How are you doing, Michael? I'm doing great. How are you doing today, Julio? Great. Um, you know, just uh, learning more about you, the the star of the upcoming premiere episode of High Stakes Poker. That's got a nice <laughs> ring to it, right? That's so funny that you said that. But yeah, I, I've not heard anyone say it in that term before. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, There's some other guys there. Right. There's yeah. some other guys there. We'll get to that. We'll get to that and uh, how you found your way onto that show. Uh, but I want to go back to the beginning. Because you're a very unique guest for this podcast. Uh, normally, we have a bunch of poker degenerates on here, but uh, you have a much different background, um, having played in the major leagues. That's crazy. Uh, first professional athlete we've had on. Sorry, poker players, they don't count. Uh, let's talk about um, growing up in Fairfax, Virginia, because you were basically like the most gifted athlete of all time to come out of that area. Right. It's crazy. (laughs) I was reading through your Wikipedia page and the, the list of accolades is outstanding, you know? Well, I appreciate that. I'm, I can tell you uh, with certainty that I'm not the most gifted athlete to come out of the Northern Virginia area, but I do appreciate the compliment. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Now growing up in, in that area, there's, it's actually a pretty, pretty good hotbed 
um, for, for basketball, baseball, actually it's turned into lacrosse, but, uh, you know, that's the, no, no one cares about lacrosse anymore. I feel like, so, um, I, I've always been a sports guy and a math guy, you know, kind of growing, growing up sports was my dream. I always wanted to, uh, you know, be a major league pitcher and was fortunate to sort of work my way to get there. So you're, for those who don't have the visual six, eight, 240. Is that fair? That's exactly right. I, I've been 240. I know what that feels like. Uh, six, eight, <laughs> six, eight doesn't, uh, not quite. <laughs> um, were you always a big guy or was this a late bloomer situation? Or did you just know early on you were just going to be the, the dominating kid on the field? Well, I was born two feet tall, so it started from birth. <laughs> um, yeah. So I've, I've always been taller than everybody sort of at every stage, um, you know, of my life. And, Got to the point, had hit a pretty big growth spurt. I think it was like six inches in a summer. I grew from Oops. age 11 to 12. Uh, and so that really kind of catapulted me to a, you know, sort of a different level. I think I started high school at about 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, and then ended up at 6'8", and that was, that was about it. I mean, were they like putting you in special leagues because you feel like beating up on the on the little kids. I mean, I have to imagine it was a lot of uh, unfairness in your matches in all well, the sports th- growing up. One thing that I think my dad did a great job with, and I think a lot of parents don't do this anymore. They want their kid to always be the best on the team and, and all that. And, you know, I was a pretty good athlete at a young age. And so he got me into playing with all the older kids where I wasn't the best. And it really, you know, so I was like eight playing with the 10, 11 year olds and then yeah. nine playing with the 11, 12 year olds. And so, you know, being a part of teams like that, like in basketball, sometimes coming off the bench even, right. Um, instead of being the best player for eight years old, really helped me see where I wanted to go and help me develop my game and really helped me, you know, work harder. I'm an extremely competitive person, like as extreme as it, as it gets. And so the best way to motivate competitive people like myself is to, you know, get in situations where you lose and you don't like losing. So you work as hard as you possibly can to try to avoid that happening again. And so, you know, with my dad consistently putting me in leagues and teams with people older than me, um, you know, that was really, really helpful to my development. Uh, did you have a focus, the, a, a favorite growing up sport or, I mean, I know that you played at all three sports in high school and were named sportsman of the year in Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So no, I, um, yeah, my, my dad was more basketball focused than anything. I loved basketball and, uh, you know, it was probably my favorite sport at the time, but you know, it was really, it was really probably the hardest decision of my life in high school, deciding whether or not to pursue baseball or basketball in college. And, um, you know, ultimately I, Pretty much do what I do with every decision and break it down mathematically and logically, weigh the pros and cons, the risk reward, and ultimately decided that, you know, at the time I was a much, much better basketball player than I was a baseball player and got a lot better looks in colleges from like pretty much go sort of wherever I wanted in basketball. But for baseball, you know, very few teams wanted me. Um, but for my calculations, it was something to where, I was really close to this, my ceiling in basketball. So I was pretty much as good as I was going to be. Um, and baseball, you know, being six, eight as a pitcher, you know, even though I wasn't very good at the time, I felt like I had a lot of room to grow and, and sort of my potential was a lot higher in baseball. I thought, uh, than it was in basketball. So ended up, ended up choosing, choosing to go to the university of Virginia and play baseball. Okay. You're, you are glancing over a lot of crazy details in that story. Uh, one of which is how good of a high school basketball player you were. You averaged 21, 8, and 6. That's, you know, and you shot 43% from 3, which is, you know, not typical of a of the big man <laughs> in a, <laughs> on, a, on a high school team. And, uh, you know, you won the state championship. You got MVP over Roy Hibbert, uh, you know, who went on to do some things. And, and you you know... You had scholarship offers to play for Shashevsky and Rick Pitino. <laughs> yes. How do you turn down yeah, that it, Coach K or Rick yeah, Pitino it, over in Louisville, who, you know, they had a run before everything came crashing down? Yeah, it's actually really funny how everything has sort of come full circle with that. Um, 
you know, I was as a basketball player, I was a guard. And at the time, like a six, eight guard was that, that, I mean, I really could shoot it. Um, that was my strength and I could, you know, offensively I had major strengths, but defensively I had a lot of weaknesses and I was able to hide that in high school. So I could always guard the other team's center power forward. And yeah, that was kind of fine. Um, but I was, I had my lateral quickness to guard a, you know, ACC level type guard was always going to be problematic for me. Um, and, you know, going with, with, Coach K there, you know, when I was going with, with Duke, they did want me to, to come on. They thought I could be very helpful. You know, it's really hard to practice against six foot eight shooters. They don't really grow on trees, but you know, <laughs> it was going to be very tough for me to play at Duke considering how bad my defense was at the time. And, um, you know, it was just a tough, tough decision. And here come full circle. We actually just did a deal. And I know we'll get in this in a, li- in a little bit with the sort of the companies I've, I've started, but we did a deal. We are the, anal- the data analytic team for Duke basketball. So I work with Coach <laughs> K on a, on a daily basis now. Um, so it's a, okay, and the, the Duke basketball program, the assistants and, you know, Coach Shire and all those guys. So um, it's been a, it's been a kind of a funny, funny full circle that I'm back, back to basketball after, um, you know, choosing to go to, to UVA to play baseball instead. Wow. Does it give you any, any grief for turning him down? No, I mean, he, he gets a lot of play. I, was, I wasn't a five-star type guy. Like that, so, you know, I wasn't a big – I wasn't one of, the, like, a big recruit that, uh, you know, Duke missed. And let's see, uh, you know, I was more of a niche type of player um, that could fit in systems. And, you know, I certainly wasn't ranked super high on any of the prospect, you know, lists as I had, as I said, like major limitations to my game. So I don't think and- he lost sleep over it. <laughs> <laughs> Even still, uh, you know – what what a story to say that you were recruited by legends like that. Um, let's talk about where you did go because you stayed home. You went to UVA, uh, but you're you're not just you're not just the jock. You know, you're not just the uh, the muscles on campus. You're you're actually doing something in class here. You know, getting what was it? Two majors, two degrees. Uh- no, I actually actually only had a – I've got one degree. I did have enough credits um, for STAT. I just never actually went through the official process to, to get that done. Is you know, I don't know, like the baseball draft, I was drafted sort of before we had to do any of that. So kind of just took the – Yeah. <laughs> just just went, went with that. But I took – yeah, I took – ended up taking, uh, you know, many high-level STAT courses. Um, you know, during my time at UVA – I did intern for a hedge fund, and so my kind of backup plan was: like, if baseball didn't work out, I'd be a data analyst or trader at a at a hedge fund in somewhere in New York. And so I, I did that. Actually, um, you know, base you know, had a job offer if it, if it didn't work out, and I used that um, guy's name is Peter Wright, is head of PAW Partners, was the firm, and he basically gave me a list of classes to take. That look, these are classes that are going to really help you. So I ended up taking those classes and uh, as well as enough to classes of my degree and that's how i went through it and you end up getting a degree in sociology i did yes so Um, that's not exactly basket weaving you know what i mean like uh, (laughs) i I assume you had a a a more difficult course load than some of your teammates yes i certainly did Uh, that that, (laughs) that is that is very true um but you know it was sociology is actually you know very interesting and more you know, I took a lot of psychology classes as well. I tried to try to get a well-rounded education, and you know, I just feel as if you know, in life, you don't know where it's going to take you. Especially, don't know when you're 18 to 21 years old when you're taking, you know, when you're in these classes. And no matter where it, you know, took me, I tried to take as many classes as I could that I think would be applicable in my future. And you know, landed on enough classes that sociology was the degree I was going to get. I didn't didn't really have that plan going in. It just sort of worked out that way. And in the back of your mind, are you always thinking, all right, even if I have a, an amazing Major League Baseball career, I'm still going to be done relatively early in life, and I'm still going to need to have something to do afterwards. Was that was that always in the back of your mind, or was it just a... Uh, always. Yeah. You know, always in the back of my mind. I mean, there's, no matter what you do from an athletic standpoint, there's always going to be a shelf life. And so, you know, my, uh, sort of how I was raised was... You think of the big picture and, you know, the developed skills along the way, you know, to really be able to help other people and, 
you know, be able to, you know, my, my goal is to do, be as successful as I can. And then, uh, you know, hopefully make as much money as possible and give it away to, you know, charities or start our own foundation to where, you know, we can really do some good in this world. And so that's, you know, in order to be able to do that effectively, I feel you need to be as well-rounded as you can be and take, you know, classes and get experiences in all different fields of life in order to, um, be able to achieve that goal as efficiently and successfully as possible. Uh, what was your favorite part about interning at the hedge fund? Yeah, you know, trading is great because it is, and being being an analyst and interviewing there is, or interning there, excuse me, because you get a scorecard every day. So for someone yeah. that's as competitive as I am, is it's just so great. And you know, in baseball, it's not every day you get a scorecard. You don't pitch every day, and then the off season you're making these gains, but you don't know exactly how much they're helping or hurting. And in the in the stock market world, you know, every day you get a win loss and you get a number, and you know, that's fun. That's exciting, and that's actually what. Um, you know, really led me to, towards the sports betting landscape as well. You get that daily scorecard, you know, with, with, with how you're doing and, you know, seeing if your methodology is working again on a daily basis. And that's really exciting for me. And that's just what keeps me, you know, it's what different things excite different people. And that's what it does for me. Yeah. Well, you get that instant gratification too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Knowing if it exactly. worked out. Uh, let's go back to baseball. You, um, you were going to get drafted. You tell the, the teams, no, I'm going back to school. You finish your degree. Uh, and then you get picked up by the Phillies. Yeah. I was, uh, you know, I did, after junior year, most of the most of the best players that you see get drafted are either high school or they after three years of college, so their junior year. Very few people stay um, for your senior year and actually end up graduating. You know, fast forwarding, when I did make the major leagues, I was, you know, heavily involved in the players union and the licensing committee, the executive subcommittee. And an interesting stat I found out was of all major league players um, only at the time. Now, there's a little bit more now, but at the time, there was only nine players that had graduated college in all of Major League Baseball. Um, wow. And that's, yeah, so it's very, very few do that. And again, that's you know, not because there aren't very smart players. It's just that if you're good enough, you get drafted after your junior year. <laughs> and so yeah, you don't they want to graduate. They want to use your bodies <laughs> as fast <Right>. as possible. <laughs> exactly. So I kind of threw a lot of teams for a loop when I decided not to. Not to they're grabbing the Dominican kids that when they're 16, you know. Correct. No, yeah. that's a whole different, yeah. yeah. I'm all, that's a good point. I'm speaking only from the, um, you know, American player side here. So, you know, that's the, the Dominicans have a whole different, they're not part of the draft and they sign as free agents when they're 16 years old, as you pointed out. So it's a different, different type of ball game and you know, education. And that was extremely important to me. And it wasn't, yes, did I lose, you know, a hundred thousand dollars or so that I could have used at the time by staying in school by, by leaving early. Sure. Uh, but at the same time, I thought that again, in any kind of decision, weigh the pros and cons, look at the data, look at the numbers and, you know, it was pretty clear that staying in college was going to be the most beneficial strategy for my, me and my goals moving forward. Um, so I did that. I stayed and I got drafted by the Phillies after my senior year in the 14th round. There's 50 rounds in the draft. So um, I had a whopping $5,000 signing bonus. So, uh, 30, <laughs> half, so uh, uh, I used to have a, a joke with my, my friends. Like, is everyone's, no one realizes the signing bonuses in baseball. And like, oh, you just got drafted by the Phillies. Like, you're rich. And I was like, yeah. Like, what did you, what'd you sign for? Yeah, I signed for three point two thousand. But uh, yeah, it's very only like the top, you know, the first round picks and sometimes second round, and third round get paid, you know, sizable sums. And so, you know, as a fourth round pick, fourteenth round pick, excuse me, I was, you know, probably on the uh, from an odd standpoint around one in a thousand to to end up making the major leagues and that at that level. And you know, was really fortunate to be able to do some things that uh to help me get there you know it's funny our paths could have crossed uh, a long time ago i was uh i graduated from the university of florida with a degree in public relations and all i wanted to do with that was get into a media relations office in major league baseball and i actually connected with a guy named uh julio sarmiento um same name, ironically, who did the job for the Marlins when they won it in 97. Although I think his job at the time was just like 
keeping Levon Hernandez from eating too much McDonald's. But like, <laughs> <laughs> it didn't but work. yeah, it didn't work. It, it didn't work at all. Uh, but you know, that's what got me into the into the the thing. So I, I my senior year, I went down to the winter meetings in Orlando, and I actually got a job offer from the Phillies to work in their okay. media relations department. And this was 2008. So, or late 2007, I guess, December 2007. So I turned them down, <laughs> decided to stick in poker, but who knows? I could have been uh, up there when uh, around the same time. Um, so you spend three years in the minors. Um, what's your mindset at this point? Any day now? Any day now? Or Well, you know, it was a big shell shock going into major or going into professional baseball and understanding, you know, the, the, the system. And here I am with the Phillies with, you know, 175 players in the minor leagues, you know, and, and, and a full 25 man roster in the major leagues. So, mm -hmm. and looking around and seeing the pitchers that they had of the, you know, what is it? 85 pitchers they had in the minor leagues. And, you know, here I am, I'm throwing the slowest just about like my stuff is clearly below, not even below average some of the worst that that I'm looking at um and that was that was that was kind of when I had this big realization that it's very unlikely for me to make it and I'm gonna have to find in order to make it I'm gonna have to figure out an advantage or an edge that other people may not figure out or have um and that took me a while to grasp that and it took me that first full off season I spent you know, really, I, my, my thought process was, look, if I want to get there, again, I have to differentiate myself. And the way to differentiate myself was to you know, figure out what hitters were looking for, what they wanted to see, and try to do the opposite of that. Um, so instead of going, which just about every pitcher goes, this is my strength, here's my fastball, I don't care who's up at the plate, I'm throwing my, my heater, it's going to beat everybody, or my slider, or whatever it is. And, you know, looking, I, I wasn't blessed with that type of ability to be able to do that. And so um, I really spent that first off season watching as much film as I can and really building these models for hitters because they're pretty predictable creatures um, to figure out what they didn't want to see. And that's the pitches I threw. So I threw four pitches all below average to that, uh, but I could throw them in any count. And that was my kind of my biggest strength. And so, you know, being able to do that and really do your own film, your own scouting, because that really gets lost in the shuffle in Major League Baseball a lot. You know, pitching coaches and, you know, it's it's a big cover your ass type. Are, you, are we allowed to curse, by the way, on this thing? Yeah, Can go for that? it. Or no? yeah. yeah, so like, you know, like a pitching coach, for example, if you're a pitching coach on a team, if they change me or change a motion or change a delivery or whatever, and it goes wrong, then they get fired, right? <laughs> yeah, so... So they don't really tell you much, you know, that they know, you know, so, so, you know, they keep their job and everything's hunky dory. And so, um, you really have to go and do it yourself and very few pitchers know what to do themselves in order to, you know, get better. They may know what to do from a physical standpoint. A lot of pitchers, you know, here's the different types of arm care exercises and get stronger, but from a mental standpoint and pitch calling, it gets, it's just really undervalued. And really, it's still to this day, people do a really poor job, in my opinion, um, of it. And so, you know, that's what I did in the offseason is really, you know, build these models for hitters. And I had reports. I mean, nobody watched more film than I did. And nobody you know, looked in, in terms of the scouting than I did. And I was able, for my minor league career, to strike out well more than one an inning with very subpar stuff. Um, you know, my nickname around the Phillies was Houdini. He's like, how are you getting all these strikeouts? It's like magic. <laughs> And I was like, you know, I, you know, I, I wasn't, it wasn't secretive. I, they all saw me in the film. They all saw me, you know, doing what I was doing. And, uh, fortunately it was, it was good enough to get to the major leagues and, and, you know, pitch a few seasons there. Uh, before the highlights there, uh, it's kind of like poker. Like you've, uh, there's a dealer's choice event at the world series every year where, uh, once it's your turn, you can call whatever game you want from like, I think it's like 16 different games. And right. the, the top players won't pick their best game. They'll pick the worst game of the biggest fish at the table just it's, to it's, beat them up. Exactly, exactly right. It's about people don't – people always try to look at their strengths and, you know, what they do and don't consider, in my opinion, enough of 
the market factor. So like, just like you said in poker, it's exact same, same way. Sports betting is the same way that people always ask you, what's the hardest sport? You know, what, 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 what sport do you model the best? Well, it doesn't really matter what we model the best. It matters what we, how we do versus the market. So, mm, yeah. you know, if we have a, if we have a model that's an eight out of 10, but the sports betting market's a seven out of 10 versus we have a model that's a five out of 10, but the market's really a one out of 10, then I like our second one better, even though it's a way worse model than the first. Yeah. Right. Um, and so, you know, using that, having good self-awareness to me is just, is critical in all aspects, especially, especially in poker. Um, you know, you, and that's, you know, again, we can kind of skip it around, but with this, this, you know, the high stakes poker game, I think that's a, a big reason, you know, for the success I had was going in understanding that I'm the worst player at the table and not having any grandeur about, oh, I'm so much better than these guys. And it really, you know, really knowing that I'm not the best player and figuring out how can I win knowing I'm not the best player? What are the Ooh. strategies it's going to take against the market, which in this case, the market was some of the best players in the world. And so, you know, it's really whether you're playing baseball, whether you're doing sports betting, whether you're playing poker, it's all the same things, just you know, applicable on a different scale. Oh, well, that was a good teaser for high stakes poker, but we are going to stick with baseball real quick. Uh, three years in the minors before being called up. I got to know what's the biggest difference between the pros and the minors. Off the field. <laughs> I mean, all I know oh. is from what I've seen in Bull Durham. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes. Well, whatever you see in Bull Durham, it's infinitely worse than that. You get paid about $6,000 a year and the team doesn't pay for anything. So you're, you're talking six people living in a one bedroom apartment. You know, <laughs> it is bad. It is, it is. You know, the doghouse is the penthouse. I mean, you're at Motel Sixes to the Ritz Carlton. I mean, it's 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 a I cannot emphasize the difference enough between the minor leagues and the major leagues. I mean, you know, all, you know, you get the you know, the it's in all aspects where you eat, shoot the women. I mean, it's 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 all it's all, uh, it, all it all goes up um, when you get to the major leagues. So it's a uh, uh, you know, it's a very. Yeah, it, it would be, I guess, the equivalent of like little league to what you would assume the major leagues is like. I mean, it's that big <laughs> of a of a of a discrepancy. Uh, what was your what was your fondest moment of your time in the majors? Fondest moment of my time in the majors. Whew. You know, we won the NL East my first year. Um, we were the best team in baseball, actually. The Phillies had 101 wins. I ended up losing in the first round, a one nothing game in Game Five. Roy Holiday versus uh, Matt, um, Chris Carpenter, excuse me. But you know, beat, when we won the division, having my family celebrate on the field with me with the jerseys and the champagne flowing, and you know, that was really, really cool and a moment that I will always treasure. That's awesome. Least favorite professional sport, uh, baseball moment. Um, that. That would be the very first batter I faced uh, in Major League Baseball. So uh, I come in to pitch my very first outing in a – we're up by one run, and it's the sixth inning in D.C., my Major League debut, which is where I'm from. So I have like 50 people in the stands. And the first batter I get to face is this guy, Danny Espinosa, who, who I had just obliterated in the minor leagues. We had grown up together, so I knew him. I knew exactly how to get him out. I think, he, I think he's like 0 for 13 with seven strikeouts against me in the minor league. So this was like such a good thing. And here I come in the game and, you know, all of a sudden just the adrenaline, like I could not feel below my knees. Like I couldn't even feel my feet. It was just this wild, wild moment. And I like spiked the first two pitches. So 2-0, and I'm like, okay, this is not where I want to be. It's just throw a strike here. And I threw a fastball that I think is still hasn't landed yet. Um <laughs> Hundred feet, I felt like, uh, and so I ended up settling down for that and pitching well. But that first, that first batter, if I had a do over, I'd love to do that. Do that one over yeah. um, in front of all friends and family. Here's Michael Schwimmer, and then bang, uh, tie ball game all of a sudden. So that 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 wasn't too much fun. I'm picturing a. Uh, uh, do you have like a clear the mechanism uh, thing on the well, mound? <laughs> well, well, once he hit, once the ball was hit and he started running around the bases, that I remember thinking to myself, well. I didn't work this hard. I didn't come all the way for this. You know, let's, let's, <laughs> yeah. let's, let's, let's fucking go here. Oops. Another apologize again, but, uh, good. yeah, it was, that, that was the, you know, that was it. And then I sat through three innings and struck out five, including struck out Harper Zimmerman, you know, so I did well and, and, you know, didn't give up any more runs the rest of that outing, but it was, um, yeah, I wish I could, 
I wish I could have got to that place before I failed, you know, before I had, had done that. And you know, my, my friends still will still be in the, the, uh, you know, the 18 pole playing some golf and, you know, I'll still hear Danny Espinosa right when I'm about to putt to try to get in my head. So. <laughs> oh, brutal. <laughs> brutal. Uh, what about gambling on trips? Oh, that was, yeah. You want to talk about a difference. We're playing, you know, 10 cent, 20 cent blinds, poker and minor leagues. And you get to the major <laughs> leagues and, you know, I'm sitting down with, you know, Jonathan Papelbon, Cliff Lee, Chase Utley, Cole Hamels, and, you know, they're sitting there with about 500K in cash playing like 100, 200, you know, and I'm sitting there with like $3,000 buy-in because that's all I can afford on these trips. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you should have so, gotten somebody to stake you. <laughs> well, no, 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 no. I, I, I mean, playing poker, I probably pl- made more money playing poker, um, you know, th- th- than I did actually playing baseball. Those, those trips were, those weren't the, you know, that, that, in that game, I was definitely the best player in that game. Um, <laughs> where I, I was the worst player at the high stakes game, but that game was pretty, you know, fun, fun game. Jonathan Papelbon's number was 58. And so no matter what, no matter what his chip set, no matter what the time in the game was, if he had five, eight, he went all in. So, you know, like the, that was the, <laughs> the first lucky number. So that, 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 that will tell you how, how good the game was. Um, you know, although Cliff Cole are decent players, you know, they, they weren't all, you know, they're not bad players, but when you have that kind of money and you're just messing around, especially when I'm short stack, they let me, they would just basically let me like whatever two cards they had, they would just call until I got it up to about 30 or 40. And then we, you know, then I could make a couple moves, but, um, you know, it was, uh, it, it was, it was a lot of fun. I, re- I miss those guys. I miss the camaraderie. It was, it was a good time. So we've made the successful transition to the topic of poker. How did you first discover the game? First discover the game, man. So there's a there's actually a picture of me on my on my Instagram where I'm on my dad's lap at about three years old as he's playing cards and I'm watching. So maybe maybe as far back as that. Uh, uh, I certainly don't remember that. There's a picture, and <laughs> uh, you know, so uh, you know, I've always loved cards. Um, I play a lot of gin and bridge. Bridge is my favorite card game. Um, you know, just just again mental stimulation, competitive games, and you know, poker's right there and uh, yeah, I did, I guess, shoot, you know, starting at like lunch break, lunch time, you know, in high school, we play cards every lunch period, you know, and then that's going when the, the money con- maker, cause you're 34. So yeah, that's when would have been a junior in high school, I guess. But college, like freshman year of college was when the big party poker bang started. Um, and I started playing a little bit on those sites and quickly realized that you know I did not I mean I did decently I don't you know average I don't know if I made money lost money you know what was not super significant but I realized quickly that you have to have it to play online poker and to do it that way you have to have just enormous amount of discipline and time which you know as trying to have a social life, playing baseball, which is a full-time job at college. <laughs> it's hard to do all of those things. Um, Tom Dwan did it the right way and just focused on it full-time. Um, you know, and, and also, I also have, was, had no, if I had done that and focused full-time, I still wouldn't have been close to as good as those guys just because they had this, you know, inherent skill set that, you know, you can learn a lot in poker, surely, but there's still this inherent skill set, just like in baseball, you know, where Mike Trout, you know, there's still this inherent skill set that is going to take you to another level that I certainly did not have um, in poker. And so I just, you know, played off and on. We, we had our we had our our dorm. We had a game in the Dabney Lounge where it would be we'd be buying for 10 bucks and we play one, two. Like that, that, we had no idea of like semblance of what you should buy. So, of course, everyone's just buying in like 10 different times. Like and we never decided to start. Let's just start with 100. <laughs> it never happened. Uh, that's just how it was. Um, we, we, we played, so we ended up instead of doing the party poker stuff, we ended up doing that a little bit more, um, which was a lot of fun and still hang out and talk to those guys. So, uh, that's the, that's the poker through college. Then you get drafted in the minor leagues, major leagues. And yeah, I never really stopped playing, but I never played consistently at the same time. Like I never spent like a month where all I was doing was playing poker every day. So it's just kind of like these hit or miss games that I'm sure a lot of your listeners, you know, playing like, you know, Thursday night game or whatever. That, that's the type of level that I was at. Yeah. Uh, Papal Bond comes to my Thursday night game all the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
let's see. Um, you mentioned Tom Dwan. I heard a, a rumor that you two are buddies from way back. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, so I started a, you know, after done with my baseball career, I started a company called Big League Advance, which is like an investment company um, that invests in minor league players and basically building on the algorithms that I had built, you know, determining, you know, what play, you know, what to throw to players, sort of building on that and using it as an investment platform, which has been extremely, extremely successful. And then I transferred that into, you know, look, if we can build data analytics that can predict how much 18 year old is going to make playing baseball, then surely we can figure out analytics on, you know, who's going to win this one game. And so, um, you know, I used the, we ended up raising about $156 million uh, for the baseball funds. And, and again, it just, it's the, the returns are really impressive. And the use a lot of that money then to start a company called Jambos, which is our sports betting company. And once we started that company, that's when Tom Dwan found out what we were doing. Like, well, he, he, he understood what we did at Big League Advance and, you know, finding these, these players that were nobodies um, that we're investing in that ends up that end up being these really good major league players and now we're trying to do it in sports betting he has also involved in a sports betting software company and thought that there would be some synergies uh, we ended up doing a little bit of work with them but that's how I got to know him uh, and then ended up going to the ice conference in London and you know walking and Tom's like yeah come in so I walk in with Tom and it was like I was walking into a to a middle school you know, and I was walking with Justin Bieber and it was all, <laughs> I mean, it was like everybody, Tom Dwan, Tom Dwan, Tom Dwan. We couldn't walk five steps without somebody wanting a selfie uh, with him, which was, which was cool. And, you know, so, so like, what are you doing at the ice? Like, you want to play some poker? Sure, let's play some poker. So I ended up playing poker with him in London and um, some high stakes poker with him in London. And I did, I did well there. And he's like, you should continue, like, you're, you know, you're, you're not, you should keep playing. Like you should do this. And I was like, you know, anytime you want me to, you know, play, like I'm not a good, you know, I, I'm focused on the sports betting and I'm focused on these companies, but I still like playing every now and again, let me know. And I was going to be in Vegas at that time. And he's like, look, we're filming high stakes poker. You know, you want to, you want to come in? I'm sure, sure. Let's do it. And that's uh, mm -hmm. pretty much as, as simple as it gets. So that brings us to the, the return of the legendary high stakes poker show which we can now say officially is hosted again by gabe kaplan and aj benza uh that news awesome. just broke uh so the premiere episode will be coming out december 16th and they have chosen uh your grouping as the first episode um let's see here i had the <laughs> i had the photo pulled up of everyone who was in the lineup there because uh, three of them have been on this podcast in uh, Nick Petrangelo, Bryn Kenny, mm -hmm. and Jean Robert Belland. We also had Rick Salomon, uh, Mr. Dwan himself, and Brandon Steven. So, um, without revealing any big spoilers, because I don't want to do that to my listeners, uh, how was your experience? What do you mean by revealing spoilers? <laughs> I don't know well, that, I don't, I don't think you should say uh like reveal any big details of any hands or anything got uh, it got it so i went into it uh you know i had you know it was a two hundred thousand dollar buy-in and you know one i thought i'm trying to figure out what are my advantage you know again i know that as a poker player i'm the worst guy sitting there so we know that going in what am i what what advantages do i have you're the tallest um, that, yep, the tallest. That doesn't really help as much. <laughs> not, by, not by much, though. JRB is pretty tall. JRB is a big boy. Yeah, he, he's a <laughs> and he's a strong guy too. His hands. I mean, he's got he's got that he's got that offensive lineman. You don't want to mess with that. You don't want to mess with that guy. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, going into it, you know, my thought process was again, what 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 advantages can I use? And and one thing I thought I had an advantage. Um, I looked at each individual player and Tom that I had played with and known the best. Um, I really wanted to do something to ke catch him off guard. Like I had to use the element of surprise. They each play with each other. They didn't know me. They didn't know my style. They didn't know my game. They didn't know how I was going to play. Um, that's a big advantage. The element of surprise. 
And I wanted to use that in as many different ways as possible. So you'll, you'll see if you watch the show, and this is not giving spoilers, when I'm in big hands with Tom, you know, I figured there's nobody, there may not be anybody better in the world at placing people on hands than Tom Dwan. And, you know, like when you get down to these, you know, tight nut cut decisions where you have to call full, you know, raise or whatever the case may be, you know, he can really sit there, think, go through every piece of bet history, all his background. He's like a human computer and he can put you on your range of hands and make the best probabilistic decision that, that he can. And I had to disrupt that. And the one way I used to disrupt that was talking a lot. So I would do the opposite of what all poker players do. Like I'd be, I'd make a big $200,000 bet or whatever the case is. And I would just start talking and, and nobody does this in poker. And my thought process was, look, he has no idea if he plays to me long enough, he'll know I'm talking. I'm sure I got all kinds of tells and I'll open it all up, but he can't know that day one. Cause you need priors. Right. And so he is so smart. He's maybe even too smart for his own good in this case, because he's going to start to try to analyze my talking, which I'm just talking nonsense the whole time. Like Tom, I got nothing you should call or Tom. Yeah, I got it this time full. And whether I was telling, sometimes I was telling the truth, sometimes it was not, right? It's poker. But the more I kept talking, the more I wanted him to try to analyze my speech to make a decision instead of analyzing the bet patterns, the bet history, and everything he knew about me from the hand, right? So I tried to get him off his mental game, and I was able to force him into some pretty bad decisions, um, you know, by, by really just talking a lot. And so, yeah, that, that was a game plan that I had going in. The other big advantage I thought I had going in was uh, just simply financially. So I'm playing with a lot of poker pros. There aren't very many big games. I mean, the high, high limit poker, that is the premier game. I mean, that is the game where they can finally you know, play for big stakes, where they can know they're going to be paid 100%. You know, like maybe these guys <laughs> play other locations or whatnot. But that, this is big money. You can win millions of dollars. And, um, you know, so they really... This is their profession. They care about the money more than I, you know, if I lose $200,000, it's no big deal to them. It's, you know, a big deal. And they want to play good poker and they might be being backed by other people. You know, for me, not having, you know, being in, being fortunate to be in the financial situation I'm in, I thought was also a big advantage. Um, and so they, you know, when you put, make them make decisions for a lot of money was another one of my strategies. Even if it's a pure bluff, you know, make them make a decision for a lot of money. Um, so those are my two, those are my, and the last one was put myself in high variance situations. So I know if I've got, you know, a double draw, you know, if I've got six, seven of diamonds, two diamonds on the board and five, eight, right? Five, eight king, right? I'm not, I've got to go all in on that. So I, I cannot lay that down. Not that people should anyways, but even if I've got, even if I know the guy's got kings, I got to put myself in situations where 50 50 coin flips is where I want to be because I'm not the best player. I can't sit down and play these hands forever and have them pick me apart versus just like, let's push and get the 50 50 and hope the coin flip lands on my side. Yeah. Um, raise the variance. And so you raise the variance, you know, when that's, and that's what, again, this is all going back to sports betting. When you're a team that shouldn't win a game in basketball, shoot a lot of threes, increase the variance, hope they go in. Right. Um, and if you're the best team, you should try to do the exact opposite. And so, you know, they're trying to like bet and play smart poker against me. And I'm trying to make these kind of craziest type plays to really say, okay, do you really want to risk all your stack on a 50, 50, you know, and sometimes they don't. And then I win. Um, or if they do, and you hope to get, uh, you know, hope the poker gods are on your side. Uh, who at the table surprised you the most? Who at the table surprised me the most? Whew. Um, I think Bryn is just a, a, an amazing poker player. And, you know, he was surprising to me towards the, you know, you'll see kind of probably more towards the second or later episodes. You know, I, it was just really hard for me to put things together that he was doing. Um, I couldn't really figure him out at all. I think his game is just just really, really strong. And I had no, you know, it's, it's actually kind of two things. Him and Rick Solomon, who are, you know, I would consider Brent obviously a far better player than Rick. No offense to Rick. I love Rick. Um, but Rick also 
was really hard for me to get reads on him too, but in different ways. You know, Bryn is a lot more calculated and you know he's making a play or making a move. You just don't know what that move is versus Rick is just so loose all over the place type guy that is just so crazy that you have no idea. You know, he's not, he may not be calculated, right? Like, yeah. you know, Bryn's doing something calculated. Rick is just, he could be doing it because he feels like doing it, which is also scary to play against. Um, you know, so he was kind of doing, which is the strategy that I wanted. I wanted to try like more like the Rick strategy, right? And so when you have two people on that same strategy, it can get tough. Um, and so that, that was a little surprising, but you know, nothing was shocking to me. I'd seen these players play before. I knew their styles. I knew what, what I was going into. And I think that was, you know, doing the homework, doing the research. And you know, I think that was, that was helpful. Yeah, well, you got Bryn, the biggest tournament winner of all time. You have uh, Rick was apparently one of the biggest private game winners of all time. Uh, apparently, he took Andy Beal for quite an amount in a heads-up match. Um, but yeah, I can totally see why they chose this lineup as the first episode, especially considering how you're describing how you played. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Should be a fun one to watch. Works. There is, I can tell you this. Like I, I was on on. Uh... Yeah, they're on Twitter. He's like, oh, how are we not having Phil Ivey in this premiere episode? And I still don't know, you know why they chose to do what they did. And I don't know how any of those things went. But I can tell you, this first episode, there are fireworks everywhere. There's a lot of action, a lot of, lot of, lot of big pots, a lot of, lot of really interesting decisions from a variety of players. So I think from a pure poker standpoint, maybe not the big name standpoint, this will be the most fun. Uh, this will be, I don't know about the most fun, but this will be extremely fun for viewers. Uh, are we going to be seeing you again on any uh, future poker programming? Absolutely. I mean, I loved it. I had a great experience. I know that the more I play, the more likely I am to lose uh, <laughs> because they'll be, you know, be able to figure me out a little bit more. And I That's lose right. You're lowering variance. <laughs> exactly right. Um, but I'll, I'll play in, you know, every, I'll, you, you can expect to see me, you know, once or twice a year on, you know, these, I mean, I look, I grew up loving high stakes poker, like watching the show all the time and poker after dark. Um, I don't know if they're a competitor, but I watched it anyways. And uh, obviously, the Same World Network Series. Now. <laughs> yes, there you go. There you go. Uh, like a Triton, yeah, maybe possibly the Triton series I may get into. I want to get, I don't want to play these like big. To me, what's most fun about poker is playing sporadically and playing really high stakes with very few people. So it's hard for me to sit down and play like, the World Series with thousands of people yeah. and, you know, low buy in, you know, relatively low buy in. I mean, I, you know, kind of everything's relative. Um, I'd much rather buy in for 200000 or, you know, $200,000 tournament with 30 people or something like that. Like, I, I would do those things a lot more, um, you know, than, than having to sit and grind out a lot of, of hand. A, that's not my style of poker. I'm very loose. I'm a very lag player. Uh, and so I, I'm much better in shorthanded type cash games than I would be at these, you know, or, or, or smaller type tournaments than sort of these big events. Well I, well, I look forward to seeing you on the high roller circuit when they can start it up again. That'll be fun. Yeah, um, that'll be a good time. Let's talk a little bit about big league advance again. Uh, it's, the way you described it was you're basically taking these guys who, as you say, make six grand a year and sleep five to a room, and you're basically staking them based on what you think their future earnings will be. Uh, I, I know they do this a lot in uh, for um, golfers as well, right? Well, they, but poker is the best example of this. That's what I was going to get to, yeah. like There's so much staking in poker. I'm wondering what your thoughts are in that arena. So it's funny when I explain big league advance as a casual person, it's really tough for them to understand the concept. When I explain it to a poker player, they get it within five seconds um, because <laughs> they, they go through it. It's the same. It's the same thing. You know, Tom, Dwan, you know, and then maybe not Tom, Jared, whoever may want people to stake him in these things. And they want a one off. We are a full, you know, a company that does this, you know, as, as legitimately as possible, again, raising a lot of money to do it. But it would be like me going to, it would be like me going to Tom before he, like right when he started his party poker run and saying, listen, here, Tom, we'll give you half a million dollars. You give us 10% of what you make for your poker career or like the next 20 years. Right. And he, Tom, and then decide, okay, I'm going to take the 500 grand and I'm going to be a doctor and I'm never going to play poker again. He keeps all the money. Like there's no contingency on what we do on the baseball side. We, in fact, we had a player accept a deal for most of the minor leagues and quit because he was so depressed playing baseball. Um, in the minor leagues that he wanted to do something else. And that's totally fine. So these are like investment 
These are not loans in any way, shape, or form. Um, and we you should garnish you know, really, his wages. <laughs> no, <laughs> absolutely not. Take absolutely his future paycheck. <laughs> absolutely not. That's part. That's part of the risk that we take. Um, All right, but if he says look, coaching we, high school. <laughs> but the uh you know so we, we get these players so our first fund was we invested in 26 million dollars in 77 players 83 percent of the players were outside the top 300 prospects in baseball when we signed them yeah you know, so like no one and we've already had about 50 in the major leagues of the 77 and some really really big names I and mean, this is you know eight standard deviations away and it's all because of the modeling and you know what we can do in this in this field and you know we've got you know some real it's been it's been it's been great um and so that's what you know in the second fund we raised the like, 130 million and we're able to take a three percent management fee from that which again was used to to really fund jambos but you know going with these players it's you know it's interesting that it's Players do these deals for a variety of reasons. Some are actually kind of these higher picks that sign for a lot of money. They don't necessarily need the money. They do it as a smart business decision. Like as me personally, the reason I kind of started this is I was in the minor leagues and you offered me a hundred thousand dollars and I had to give you 10% of what I made in the future. And I had a crystal ball and I knew for a fact I was going to make a hundred million dollars. So if I sign this deal, I'm going to lose $10 million. I consider myself to be decently intelligent in general, for a baseball player, highly intelligent, um, I still make that deal because I've got nothing and I'm getting $100,000 right now versus what I'm giving up, $10 million, but I already have $100 million. So the difference between 90 and 100 is not so great for me, but the difference between $100,000 million when I got $100,000 when I got nothing is a huge difference to me. Right. Um, right. And so, you know, a lot of players are making decisions, like business decisions, you know, and, and look, you don't know, you could be the best pitcher. You look at these top number one prospects in baseball. They never even get to the major leagues. Shoot, half of first round picks don't get to more, like 80% of first round picks don't get to free agency. That's first <laughs> round pick. I mean, this is a tough, tough game. Um, less than 10% of minor leaguers will play one day in the major leagues. So, um, and you're not evaluating these guys like lottery tickets or the old school eye test uh, way of, that you know baseball scouts use. I'm assuming you you have some kind of money ball Jonah Hill type with a laptop behind you, you know, <laughs> telling all, you who to pick. That's all it is. It's, these, it's all it is is the algorithms, the models, and we built it over. You know, we've refined it. We still refine it. It's an organic model, always trying to improve. But we've had it for five years, and it's been. Yeah, it's been amazing to the point where we have teams calling us all the time, asking us to do things. You know, we're making more, you know, the, you know the, it's something that is always good to get that sort type of affirmation. Um, you know, we obviously choose not to do that um, for financial reasons, but, um, you know, it's been extremely fulfilling to, to do this. And... and so the players that don't make it, instead of being left for dead, now we can they can start a second life. Like these people, yeah, you know, that, that are making no money. I mean, imagine going, you know, going to college and spending five years. Now you're, you know, 27 years old and you've got zero applicable experience to the real world and no money. You know, yeah. now at least if you don't make it, this is why I tell my investors, like, look, you can invest in all these other funds you want. You know, you can you know, and if you lose money in Apple stock, you lose money in Apple stock. If you lose money with us, you're making people, you're you're saving people's lives. Right. Um, and that was, that's sort of my pitch to investors. And we've been really fortunate to share in the success of these players. We, we have one player I can name, Fernando Tatis Jr., one of the best players in baseball. He's mm. on record having done a deal with us. Um, and, you know, he's on record saying, look, like, yeah, I'm going to give them a lot more money than they gave me. But at the same time, they helped me when nobody else really believed in me. I mean, shoot, he was traded for James Shields, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, that, you know, we feel as if there are very few mutual financial beneficial choices people can make. And I think poker's the same way. You know, Tom Dwan accepts a million dollars for 10% stake and he ends up making a hundred million dollars. Yeah, he lost 10 million, but I bet Tom's happy with that, even though he could have made more, right? Not to mention, um, it's he one of probably plays better, better with that first stake under his belt. How many of these players get that in 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 flux of cash from you guys and all of a sudden they play looser and better knowing they don't oh, have to worry about their and, next meal and instead of sleeping on an air mattress now get yourself a 
bed. Right. Instead of instead of shopping at Safeway, you can shop at Whole Foods and get yourself healthy. And instead of driving Ubers in the off season, you can pay for a trainer. I mean, all the things that we do with players drastically helps their chances to succeed and yeah. and live their dream. And so, you know, that's why we get that's why you know you can't we get every player we sign. We get these great notes, and you know, the, even players that are in the major leagues are going to give us way more money than we gave them. I mean, it's just so great to see how much they love us, and you know, think that we help. And it's it's again goes back to you know my early days, parents, and in, in, engraving in me, you know, do things to help people. And I think yeah. this is certainly one of those things. Um, well, you can still make money while do. doing it, right? We I should get it. poker uh, poker stakers to include some poker training <laughs> with their stake. You know, try to <laughs> try to improve the circumstances as well. Uh, so Jombos comes along. You're, it's a touting service, obviously. Uh, what you know, you gotta be excited about what the sports betting landscape is looking like, especially all the changes that have happened in the last few years. Yeah, well, Jambos, we we were not a touting service anymore. Um, oh, okay. so I'll give you, I'll give you the, uh, the background of Jambos. I think it's pretty, especially if you guys, listeners are sports betting fans here. Um, so we started Jambos, we started building these models and we found out that the models that we were building to predict outcomes of games were just outrageously predictive and good. Um, and we could make a lot of money doing this problem was actually making bets, uh, and doing this in a legal way. I went to Las Vegas, um, was shut out of, uh, you know, wasn't able to bet close to as much as I wanted. I was shut down to $300 a bet. Um, and I don't know if people know that they can do that, but they can. Yeah. So we can't like raise up, you know, if, if, if sports betting were a, um, you know, like the stock market, I'd raise a billion dollar fund and we'd be betting, you know, tens of millions of dollars a game and we'd be doing fantastic. It's not. So we had to figure out a way to monetize it. And, the one way in betting has to be overseas and it takes like to get licensed and all that stuff. It takes time. So we thought, you know, looking at the sports betting landscape, um, I saw an industry, the touting industry, which I thought is possibly the most despicable industry that I have seen in the United States. Um, maybe outside of like, you know, payday lending. Um, Hmm. and you know, like these are all scam artists trying to like buy your pick. They have no financial responsibility. They are, you know, buy these picks if they don't, you know, whatever happens. So I wanted to create a, I wanted to erase my goal, which I failed miserably in was to erase them from the planet by creating a subscription service that didn't do any of those things. So like we said, look, if you pay for our picks and maybe cost $3,000, the picks lose, we'll give you 10,000 back. So we are financially responsible. If the picks lose. We're going to, you know, do everything in terms of, you know, we're, we're going to post the lines. We're going to tell you what sports book had that line. So you can actually go back and check. Cause instead of like some of these books post like fake lines, like all these things, right. that these artists touts do, we want to do the opposite and hopefully erase them from, you know, existence. Um, what ended up happening was we were doing very well and the sports books started subscribing to our picks and they, the lines would fly. And so we would post <laughs> out, we would post, you know, we want the New England Patriots minus three, and we'd post that out, and then within seconds, it'd be new, minus four. And so, like, our subscribers now weren't able to get down at the prices that we were saying, and we had a lot of pushback. Like, you're posting these lines, yeah, they were that at 1230, but 1231, it's minus four, so now the game ended at three, we lost, you pushed, so your record's not our record, like, all this stuff, and I felt awful. Um, because I wanted to be in full line with subscribers. And so I shut, I shut down the whole, the whole service. And then at the same time, that was about six months in, we got licensed overseas. We have a company in Isle of Man and we just start betting our own money with all tier one operators and post COVID, um, you know, we're up, um, you know, about two to $3 million, somewhere in that range, average bet size, about $10,000 of that. Uh, that's wow. basically what we get down all from tier one operators. Um, and I am very proud, you know, this has obviously gone through the sports betting industry. So again, the reason I, big reason I was in Vegas meeting with, you know, this is obviously stuff that sports books are extremely interested in. And we, I want to, I want to completely change the sports betting landscape. And, you know, right now how sports betting works, they shut out sharp betters. They don't take big limits and they juice the lines like crazy. And I want to create a sports book that's like a prop trading desk. 
that allows big bettors. We want sharp action and we want to use our models. We think we're the, in a poker term, we want to play with all the best poker players because we think we're the best ones at the table. Um, and we don't really think that. I know it might sound conceited, but we know that. Uh, we know that because of the data sets we've seen from sports books, there's no sports better that has performed better than, you know, over that same time frame and same number of bets. Um, and so really working with them to use our stuff for pricing and risk management. Um, you know, we are in talks with multiple, uh, multiple sports books around the United States in order to be able to do this. And, and I would assume something would get done here probably the next six to nine months where we can, we can really do that. And we can, you know, what we do know is whoever, whatever sports book wants to do this, they will be the highest handle sports book in the United States. Uh, you know, because it'll be the only sports book that allows these big bets that allows sharp action to come in and, um, and trust the models that the revenue will, will follow behind. So that's our proposition. And hopefully we can, as disruptive as we've been and successfully in baseball, we hope to do that same thing in the sports betting world and give people more fair pricing, uh, better limits, more prop selection, and hopefully can turn that around for, for the U S sports better. Well, there you have it. Jumbo's coming to a uh, regulated market near you soon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have some rapid fire questions to wrap it up. If you're ready to go. Hit me. Have you ever been starstruck? Yes. Uh, Bruce Springsteen going okay. I was in concert. I was in concert like two rows back and six, eight is really helpful for concerts. And, uh, and he was on <laughs> spirit of the night and he's like in spirit of the night. And he gave me the microphone and say all night, like the part of the chorus. And I was yeah. like, I was like, my knees were a little shaking. I'm like, what am I like? This is, I was almost embarrassed that it was, that I was, but I certainly was. Did he pull you on stage so you could no, do no, no, the, the, no, no, the no. dance? <laughs> <laughs> no one wants to see that, I can promise you. <laughs> a man, 6-8 at a concert. I'd hate be, to be behind you. <laughs> it's the best. <laughs> <laughs> I'm jumping on those shoulders, maybe. Let, <laughs> let's see. Um, what's the biggest pot you ever won or lost? Your choice. Um... Biggest pot I ever won. The biggest pot I ever lost happens in 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 the show. So you'll uh -oh. see. Yes, uh, still ended up winning though, so that's good. But I lost All right. the pot. And not only did I lose the pot, I every single stage of the hand I played horrifically wrong. So <laughs> it's not like it was like a bad beat or anything. I just played it awfully. Uh, um. The biggest pot I've ever won, uh, $380,000. It was in London playing with Tom. Um, I, I think that's probably the biggest pot I've ever won. And I think, you know, biggest pot I've ever lost. We'll have to see. I don't know what the exact numbers are about, about, about that same amount. All right. Wow. That sounds like an exciting episode. Uh, all right. Um, do you have a celebrity doppelganger or somebody people told you you look like growing up? Uh, it's so funny. Like, I'll still play basketball, and there's this – um, Goodman League, which is in Southeast DC, and it's uh, yeah, I'm 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 the only white guy there. Um, but it's a lot of fun playing basketball with those guys, and they have like a mic announcer, uh, like a DJ type thing announcing these games, and then they always like oh, Brooke Lopez from three. So I get a lot of Brooke Lopez. <laughs> um, so that's I guess the most common. Hold on, I'm looking up Brooke Lopez real quick because. <laughs> Yeah, I could I could see that. When he had he's, a, when he's he had a little bit hair. more, he's he's got stronger facial features. He's a little bit more oh, caveman yeah. like. He's seven foot one, and way better looking than me, but I'll take it. You know, I don't mind it. So. You know who I was? Uh, who I was thinking? What's his name? Um, no, it's not him. Brad uh, Pitt. Yep, yeah, Brad Pitt. <laughs> in in all in all of his best roles. Um, uh. No, I'm I'm drawing a blank on his name, so forget it. All right. So, what was your worst job uh, growing up? Worst job growing up. Uh, well, I was in the minor leagues. So it wasn't necessarily growing up. And to make ends meet, I did a lot of babysitting, and I was refereeing basketball games. And I would be refereeing these like middle, like these sixth grade girls basketball games. And it's just so hard to like. Do you call a travel every play? Do you kind of let them play? You know, right. 
uh, <laughs> running with the basketball. But um, you know, that's a that that wasn't. And, and I have I had a great time refereeing those games. It was the parents and the coaches that were acting like this was Game Seven of the of the NBA Finals here. Uh, that was a little a little annoying. But um, that, that that was tough. But it was again, I would wouldn't trade it for anything. You got uh, Division One scholarships in all three sports you played in high school. Uh, was there a sport you ever bad at? Anything in the water and anything that's in the X Games. Awful. I've got <laughs> terrible. Athletically, I'm like extremely gifted in areas and extremely awful. And like balance is a terrible, terrible. Like anything that involves balance, I can't. I don't know if I could stand on a skateboard. But you know, hand-eye coordination has always been my biggest strength. Like when it comes to like shooting a basketball you know, locating a pitch, um, you know, that, that's always been my strength. And so any sport that is more, anything that has endurance or a lot of balance involved in it is I can, I don't know how you are as an athlete, Julio, but I would bet that you'd be better than be at it. <laughs> I don't know. I suffer from vertigo. So oh, that, then, then we'd be even. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so we'd be even. I'm going to, I'm going to have that one, uh, uh, printed out and framed. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see here. What was your largest non-poker wager? Ooh, that gets into sports. I mean, we bet millions of dollars in sports. So, mm -hmm. um, on uh, one contest? No, nah, not on one contest. I think the most we've had on one contest was about 780,000. Wow. Uh, uh, yes, <laughs> we had, it was on the under in the Super Bowl that won. So that was nice. nice. Um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, there's the sports betting is 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 definitely that the um, I did hit the most the biggest odds. I know it's not the right question, uh, but the biggest odds I've ever won a bet on of substantial proportion was I did bet six hundred dollars to win sixty thousand on Joe Burrow to win the Heisman, and it was my only Heisman bet that I made. Wow! Again, all all model related. Um, and he's like, usually these future bets are really heavy juice and they're not, you know, these are not smart bets to make. And so like, we kind of ran it. We thought he had a, I mean, look, we thought he had a 5.2% chance to be Heisman and the odds were 1%. So, but it's not like we thought, Oh, these guys could definitely going to make it, but no, yeah, uh, it's just 4.2% edge. And we went with it and it was great. So that was nice. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's a pretty big hit. Uh, okay. I know this is a long shot, but if any, Major League Baseball player is not superstitious, it would be you, right? Are you superstitious uh, I, at all? Yeah. <laughs> it's so sick that I am superstitious. <laughs> even though I be, right? <laughs> know even though I know it's wrong. Like I know it's wrong, but yeah. I will we're watching Sunday games and I will switch seats, you know, when things aren't going well. And I will I will do you know, I do so many dumb superstitious things that don't matter at all that I still like somehow believe in that matter. So I've got the same, you know, my daughter gave me these socks. Um, they've got like pizza socks for like a birthday, you know, when she was like two, where, you know, she like picked them out of the store. And uh, so I wore those for my poker debut, which was good luck. And I wear them Sundays for, for games. And so I still wear those good luck pizza socks. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I still, I still do the things, even though obviously if you put me on a lie detector, I'll say they, add, they don't mean anything at all, but I, I will st still do them. What about a ritual before you took the mound? Um, well, so I would, <laughs> I would go, I would go. So I'd be warming up in the bullpen and I had somebody designated on the bullpen. They'd all fight for this role. And right before, so you walk from the mound to, you know, you pass everybody to then go down steps and then go in the game. And as I'm walking through, somebody would slap is me as hard as they could in my face. And that was what? my ritual. Yeah. So I get really angry and then run in the game. Wow. It's a good yeah. job for Houdini's assistant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would get me, uh, just, you know, I, when you're and it was actually data and science behind that, you know, when you get, when you get into these modes of, you know, more fighter fighter, like this, these spouts of anger, you can really increase you know, endorphin release, energy release, and get strength that you might not normally have. And I felt like I could do that in a way where I could still keep, it usually can be problematic for people because their emotions can go high. But I knew that mm. because I wanted it to happen, I was able to get that, get the anger going while keeping my emotions intact. Um, 
and so that was a that was a ritual that uh, my wife certainly did not like seeing, but uh, mm -hmm. it worked out pretty well for me. So I'm going to go back on YouTube and watch some highlights and see if I can see a handprint. You can, on, uh... you you will you will be able to see a couple <laughs> handprints. You won't ever. I've never seen somebody that actually captured it. No one ever really because when you go to that stage, it's like a covered area. So I don't think like TV cameras and usually TV cameras are above the bullpens. Mm, so yeah. I don't think it's a tape. Uh, so we ask uh, everyone what's their favorite gambling movie. You can answer that, but I'm also interested in knowing what's your favorite baseball movie. I mean, no question rounders. I know that's probably the obvious answer. Um, yeah. A lot of people say that I'm sure it's just, just such a classic for me. Uh, favorite baseball movie. This one's much tougher. I have like three or four. Uh, there's so many good ones. Um, used to be Bull Durham, but you know, for the love of the game, gets me pretty good. Right. Uh, maybe I'm older and sappy, but uh, I love that. I love no, that. I, uh, it's so funny because I could take or leave like all the little love story side <laughs> stuff. I just love seeing him on the mound in that final game. Yeah, exactly. And obviously, catcher, how you know. great is how great is Br Riley uh, as a catcher in that? He's oh so yeah, good. yeah, um, yeah. You know, but, any any movie where Kevin Costner's in, in playing a sport, I'm into it. Of course. Uh, all right, we end the podcast the same way every time with a question from the random question generator. You ready? Let's do it. All right. Is uh, who's your favorite artist? I'm guessing it doesn't mean like painter, just like any. Well, artist. Peter Lick is my favorite artist. If we're talking artwork, um, and if we're talking any artist, it's got to be Bruce. It's got to be the boss, Bruce Springsteen. The boss, Bruce Springsteen. Okay, Peter Lick. I'm I'm uh, googling him now. Oh, okay. So like, uh, yeah, like of, we have a lot of his stuff in in our house. Um, big fan of his. A lot of nature scape stuff. Yeah, well, very it's just it's be kind of serene. Keeps you in a good little meditative state a little bit when you walk by and see it. So. I like that. It looks like uh, it looks like photos, like all digital are, altered photos. That's what they are, correct? Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, "Oh, he painted these." <laughs> no, he most certainly did not do that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Michael, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing the stories. Thanks for having me. That's it. That is the show. Thank you once again to Michael. You can follow him on Twitter at m schwimmer. And that is Schwimmer with only one M. You can also follow us on Twitter at Card Player Media or at Poker underscore Stories. If you like what you heard, please subscribe. Uh, then scroll down to the bottom of your podcast app and give us five stars. After that, go ahead and write us a nice review. If you can do all three of those things, we'd like to reward you with a free digital subscription to Card Player Magazine. Just let us know by sending an email to pokerstories at cardplayer.com. Thanks for listening.